Here we are today at the Don LaFontaine VoiceOver Lab and I'm joined by Joe Cipriano. Welcome Joe. Thank you for taking time out to meet with us today, Joe. Thanks Andy, I appreciate it. Yeah, it's good being here with you and welcome to the lab. This is it. This is what we have done to honor Don LaFontaine. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Well, just in a little while we'll talk about that, but first of all I'd like to learn a little bit about you. Mm -hmm. um, and apologies for my voice, it's the air conditioning of, uh, of LA that's just got to me. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. Um, you're first and foremost known as the promo voice and you've been promo of Fox for quite a few years now. Yeah, I started in 88, so it's been uh, 22, 24 years. Okay. That's wow. Yeah. So that's been a while. And you're also on several other... CBS. Uh, I've been with CBS since 1997. And uh, that came about, um, and a, a lot of voiceover, and you probably have experienced this as well, uh, is through relationships. And I had been at Fox for um, nine years, from 88 to 1997, and one of the um, heads of uh, marketing moved over to CBS to kind of change around their marketing stance and their image. CBS at the time was known as kind of like the blue-haired old lady uh, <laughs> network, you know. Yeah. And so um, they were going in with new programming and a new idea to change that image and, and make it younger. And through the relationship that I had established with uh, Ron Scalera, who was the head of promos uh, at Fox, moved over to CBS, they started looking for different voices. And, and he called me one day and he goes, you know what? Everybody we listen to, we compare to you, and we say, why, it's just too bad it doesn't sound like Joe, and would you consider coming over? So that, I thought that that would be the end of my Fox years, sure. but I was able, thanks to Don LaFontaine, who also at that time was working at Fox, at CBS, at NBC, he was all over the place. So um, it wasn't so strange that there might be a voice that was on two different networks, so I was very lucky to be able to have that. Okay, so you'd set the scene before we d before that. Okay, so you started 1988, you say, but before mm -hmm. 1988, what were you, what were you uh, Well, about? I started as a kid in uh, radio, uh, okay. as an on-air presenter, a disc jockey, it's what we call them here. Okay, and in the UK as well, but yeah. kicking back before that, what, mm -hmm. why, why did you go into radio? Uh, you know, growing up as a kid, um, uh, I, I knew I wanted to do something that had uh, some sort of connection with entertainment. Um, mm -hmm. Mostly it was television or radio. I kind of really wanted to do TV. And uh, what happened was when I was in fourth grade, I... Uh, what's, my, what's that mean in English? Sorry. Uh, fourth grade would be uh, 10 years old. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, when I was 10 years old, we went on a field trip. Uh, our class to a radio station in Hartford, Connecticut. I grew up in Connecticut. Right. And uh, as we were touring, it was, on, it was a radio and TV station. We toured the TV studios first and I thought I was very impressed with that and to see those big cameras and you know I was really starting to dream big about that. Gosh, wow, you know, this would be something that I want to do. And as we walked down the hall, we came to this big window looking into this studio and there were two men um, in this studio behind microphones and there were speakers in the hallway and there were about 35 of us, you know, kids 10 years old. and. They were just having a blast. They were having cool. such a fun time. And I thought, okay, this, now this is really fun. And I bet if I do really good and get into this room, I bet I can get into that other room <laughs> over there too at the same time. So um, that kind of stewed for me for four years. And at 14 years of age, I called a disc jockey at the local radio station and said, you know, it's all I think about is radio and I want to get into radio. And he invited me to come down to the radio station in our yeah. local town. And that began um, from 14 years of age to 16 years of age, two years of me going to the station every week. I would go every Saturday. I'd file records. I'd go get the disc jockeys lunch. I'd do whatever I could. And um, in return, they would let me go into one of the studios and make believe I was on the radio and do my own radio show. And eventually, uh, when I turned 16, I got hired at that station. And that began my career in radio. And uh, I went to full-time in radio. I was still uh, only in, uh, what, 11th grade, mm -hmm. 12 grades altogether, uh, going through high school. Uh, I worked on the air while I was um, going to school during the day. 
and I would do my homework at 16 years of age while the songs played. You know, I had my books <laughs> out over the, the console, and I'd do my homework, and homework suffered. Radio show was good. <laughs> And uh, then when I graduated, they gave me the afternoon slot there because I, I thought about college and I thought, gosh, it's just going to slow me down four years. And so I went right into it um, head first, feet first, okay. uh, and uh, grew in the radio business, which led me then to voiceovers as well. Okay, so it's very much you followed, you had a, a seed planted there and you followed mm -hmm. that passion. That's, yes. That's wonderful. Yeah. And wonderful that you had the guts to get out and do that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I think I was, you know, when you're that young, I think that you probably don't think things through too far ahead. And uh -huh. thank goodness, because, you know, that's what happens when you get a little bit older. You might have a dream, you might think you want to do something, but then your mind starts to work and you go, well, gosh, if I do that, what's really going to happen? How am I going to do this? And when you're young, you just do it, and, and it worked out. And I, I guess your parents supported you. My parents were extremely supportive. They loved that I had found something that uh, was a passion for me. They used to pick me up. Uh, I would take the bus to the radio station, you know, before I, I was working there, and they would pick me up at midnight and uh, take me back home on Saturdays. And then eventually, when I turned 16, I had my uh, you know driver's license. I was able to drive in, and you know, uh, and I went from 16 years of age on the air up until about 20 years of age, where I finally um, found a, a job at a major uh, city, Washington D.C., mm -hmm. our nation's capital, and uh, work there uh, was hired by NBC to work there as a disc jockey, and about six months into it, I met my wife Anne who was also working there as a news writer. She was her very first day uh, of work and I bumped into her in the hall and that was the beginning of our relationship and we were married um, three years later, three and a half years later. Wonderful. And she and I are both broadcast kids. So she understands what voiceover is, she understands what radio is and very supportive and, and it's so nice to have somebody that's your best friend and that is your your spouse who understands what you do and you, you have this this common interest because we, we both came from broadcast sure so we always have that and and as I've seen with uh, trying to fix up this time with you you've had you've been on and off for a couple of times thinking that you had a job coming up of course she yes. has to be very understanding about that oh she yeah she's amazing <laughs> she is amazing uh, and it's always been like that you know radio was a little bit more steady when once I got into voiceover you never know when you're like tonight, uh, when we were speaking here, um, it could have been that I had a session right now. Yeah. It was it was on hold, and then I found out that it was released and moved to tomorrow. Uh, my buddy Scott Rummel, who uh, was going to be here at the lab today mm -hmm. for a meeting, uh, he thought he had a session that got delayed, and that's moved to tomorrow. So you're constantly we're, we're, there. Are so many times you're putting your coat on, getting ready to go out to dinner, and you get a call, and it's like, oh. We're not going out to dinner yet, <laughs> you know. But the nice thing is, uh, in voiceover, which I love, every time you work, you get paid. Yes. So, you know, it's not so bad. Yeah, it's not. It's it? not, it's so, not bad, so bad. You know, and, and then Anne will go back and you know she maybe start pick up a book that she was reading and, and you know we'll be delayed a half hour and then we then we go off to dinner. You know. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So you managed to make the transition from radio into into voiceover. Was it a natural progression for you to be? Wait, well, well, actually, maybe I should ask you. Did you go straight into doing uh, promos and? Yeah, uh, not not really. I, I, although it was the the genre of voiceover that I was most interested in. I was in radio and I in Washington D.C. And I was very much interested in voiceovers, and I started, we, we didn't have agents there. You really marketed yourself, okay. and you sent out your demo tape, and I made my own demo tape, and I sent it out to the actual ad agencies um, looking for work. Is this something that, um, I don't know the American market, but that's how... I'm working in, in Istanbul. I, I'm, uh, You're doing uh, in fact, I, an agent. After six years, I left my agent and I'm working solely freelance. Mm -hmm. now. Um, in the States, can people well, work see, like that Well, it depends. Now? At, at a certain level, like that was a, in a local market and there weren't, mm -hmm. and this was back in the 70s, sure, that's late what, 70s. So, so there, there wasn't really, it was a union work, it was AFTRA and Screen Actors Guild work. Um, the radio station I worked at was an AFTRA station. Um, but it just wasn't set up to have talent agents there. 
they had a couple of casting companies and you could solicit them and go to them. Uh, but there was no agent that would represent sure. you. Uh, and it wasn't like it needed to be negotiated. At that point in your career, you're working for scale. And so, you know, it's like you get the job, scale is X amount of dollars, and that's what you get paid. And it goes through the union. So I did, you know, pursue that. And it was about that time that I became aware of people like Ernie Anderson, who was the voice of ABC, and Danny Dark, who was the voice of NBC. And because I was in broadcasting and working at NBC, I thought, wow, th this is really an interesting, um, again, another way to get into TV, mm -hmm. uh, to be a voice of a network. And that's something that really sparked an interest in me, and that was something I was going to go after. But my first voiceover gigs were regional, East Coast, local jobs for maybe department stores or car dealerships and things like that. But I knew, and Ann and I both knew, that if we wanted to do the big gigs, and if she, she was in television by then as a news producer and writer, that we either needed to go to New York City or Los Angeles. Okay. And so we took a trip. We did a 10-day trip, five days in New York City, five days in Los Angeles, and we looked at each other once we got to LA, we went to New York first, and we said, Los Angeles, I think that's Yes. <laughs> so then it was a matter of trying to get a job out here in radio. It took me about a year and a half and I got a job. Because that's a, uh, something I always tell young people in voiceover or in any business, don't move to a new city without a job. Uh, have a job waiting for you because, especially coming to LA, to be just another starving actor um, doesn't set you apart from the masses. And when you go into uh, an audition and you need that audition, desperately, either for breakfast tomorrow or to pay your rent, that that stench, and I'm sorry to use that word, of desperation it wafts through the room. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, it puts you uh, in a very bad situation. And I think that's uh, um, important thing to bring out, that people look at you now and they see the work that you're doing now and the history of the, of the recent years um, although it's a long recent years, mm -hmm. um, and they th it's very easy to think, oh, you've always been like this. Mm. Um, yeah. That's, that's really why I wanted to learn, to hear about yeah. your 10-year-old experience, because that's so important, that's part of the story, yes. and, and it's so easy to, to look at somebody where they are today and forget mm -hmm. about where they came from. Sure. Everybody has to struggle, and, and you know what? It's not worth the journey unless you do struggle a little bit. Sure. Because you have to experience the downs and those difficult times so that you can really appreciate the successes, you know? So, and I truly believe that, and yeah, I mean, you look at anybody, any anyone in, in pretty much any profession, there are those times when perhaps there's a struggle or there's a decision that has to be made. Am I going to go this way or am I going to go that way? And it's that turning point oftentimes mm -hmm. that can change somebody's life for the rest of their lives. And uh, so, yeah, um, you know, it's a matter of, uh, for me, in voiceover, I knew radio so well, I had to learn what how do you become a success in voiceover? What do you do? Mm -hmm. And there weren't, at the time, wouldn't have facilities like this where people can come here free of charge and take seminars and workshops and, and be taught, you know, what you do to get into voiceover. It's okay, such a genre, you know. And, and let's just talk about the uh, DLF lab, the Don LaFontaine mm -hmm. uh, voiceover laboratory. Obviously, Don was uh, somebody who played an important role in your life. You mentioned that mm -hmm. a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. So, could you summarize maybe that and, and, uh, how, and, and what happens here? Uh, yeah, sure. You? Well, Don, as you know, was you know, the king of uh, promos and trailers. He also did commercials as well, but he really, truly excelled in marketing, uh, being that voice that markets films, and mm -hmm. not just uh, run-of-the-mill films, but the biggest of the big films, and, and all the television networks. So he was kind of like the state of the art, you know, uh, when it came to that. He almost invented that genre of what we hear today, what we do today for movie trailer uh, announcing. Uh, you know, that, those reads are so done. He wrote the, that copy in a world. I mean, that's something that he penned and that it's still used today. Um, because he came from a marketing background himself. He uh, would write these commercials for films. Okay. And uh, one day, the voiceover guy didn't show up. And they said, well, why don't you do it? And boom, a career is born, you know. And um, so he, uh, he always did something um, that was truly remarkable. He was a good friend 
of mine, of Paul Pape, who's a co-founder, George Whittem, and all of our advisory board members who also are in promo trailers. Um, he would, uh, he, you know, you probably heard the stories, he would go from session to session in his limo. Uh -huh. It's before the days of ISDN, and um, he literally could have two, three sessions within an hour. So you have to speed around Hollywood. At least the studios were relatively close. Sure. So to stop himself from going absolutely crazy, uh, he always had Clinton, his driver, uh, waiting for him in the limo. And he would bound out of the studio, jump into the back of the limo, and they're off to the next. And in those days, I would see Don four times a day. I'd see him at Wood Holly, and then I'd see him at Fox. And I'd catch him over at CBS and back at Wood Holly again, you know, because we were all doing that thing. You know, I might have five sessions a day. He's got like 15, 17 sessions a day. You were sprinting more. between the two. Yes, and... exactly. <laughs> I, was, yeah, I was schlepping, you know, right? Or schlepping uh, between the two. Um, so um, the thing that Don used to do in that limo was he would take people with him on a ride along to ex people who wanted to get into voiceover to experience what it's like for uh, to be around somebody who's at the very top of voiceover. Yeah. And also pick up all of that experience of how do you relate to the director? How do you relate to the mixer? What do you do? What does copy look like? I mean, you're actually reading the picture? How do you do that? You know, Do you practice? There were three beeps before you start talking. I mean, there's so much to learn in promo and trailer. And it was like an advanced course in one day. Uh, people like George DeLoyo, who's now one of the most popular voiceover artists there are in the world. I mean, he does English-speaking narration for tr promos, trailers, commercials, and he has an entirely different career uh, in uh, Spanish. He's, mm -hmm. um, you know, fluent in Spanish. So um, he went on a ride along. So many people that are, are now uh, a success in this um, in this world of voiceover, went on a ride along with, with Don and learned how it's done. And when Paul came up with the idea, Paul Pape, of uh, doing something, he came up with the idea of this lab that would be like a virtual ride along with Don. Don's no longer with us, but Don's, you open up the door, you're in Don's place now, and you're going to experience what it's like to do voiceover, yeah. what it's like to do promos and trailers and commercials and narration and ADR and looping and all the different genres. And we have the people that are at the top of those professions that come in here and teach. They donate their time. And 14 people at a time come in for this one-on-one -on -one sort of an experience. They get into the booth and they're uh, directed and taught. and. Uh, and they get to experience what it is, and, which makes it a lab. It's a laboratory. It's an, it's an experience. And it's a way of you giving back yourselves yes. in the way that Don the gave way back Don to did. you. You're exactly. paying, he paid it forward to you, you're yeah. paying it forward to others. Exactly. So um, if somebody wants to learn, out, learn more about mm -hmm. the lab, where would they find that out? You can go to sagfoundation.org, mm -hmm. uh, and you'll click on the little tab up there for the uh, Don LaFontaine voiceover lab. We're also on Facebook and uh, we have a Twitter feed as well. Mm -hmm. But uh, the sagfoundation.org website is probably the best place and we welcome everybody to, to come and check that out. Excellent. Yeah. Well, thanks very much for sharing your, thanks, uh, your experiences with us today, Joe, and pleasure to spend this time with you. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you so much. Best of luck to you. Thank you. All right. Thanks.